All right, so our next talk is uh, Gabriel Harrison. Uh, Gabriel is currently a senior conservator with Cryolite Conservation. Gabriel uh, maintained his own private conservation practice consulting uh, outdoor sculpture conservation projects. Some of his work include historic metals conservation for the Wintica Cenotaph Restoration and architectural metal conservation for the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago. Gabriel began working as a conservator in 97 with the Chicago Parks District, since has contributed to over 50 significant sculpture conservation projects. He holds a BFA in sculpture from the Maryland Institute College of Art and a longtime associate of the AIC. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Um, here to talk about a John uh, J.W. Fisk fountain that we restored last year, um, mentioned in the last talk. It's actually kind of an extension of the last talk because she did mention about uh, cast iron fountains and this is a uh, cast iron fountain from 1896. Um, uh, we were the conservators and the general contractors for the, for the project Cryo Conservation. Um, we worked with uh, uh, the Robinson Iron Company in Alabama. They, they um, essentially did all of the hands-on work with the iron, um, including coming to the site, removing it from the site, and doing all the coating work under, under our uh, direction. Um, masonry and plumbing was uh, addressed over there by a, a company called Outer Spaces. They're actually a very modern um, pool maker. They do custom pools and they, they're, um, you know, working with very modern plumbing and um, filtration systems. Um, and then we had some analytical work done, done by um, Keystone Preservation Group in, in Pennsylvania. Um, and last week we we're notified that we, the uh, state of Pennsylvania, recognized that project as a recipient of the construction award from the Preservation of Pennsylvania. So we're ha uh, you know, happy to, see, to show that. Um, so essentially, this is a, a, the oldest photograph that we have of the, um, the fountain. Um, it, was, it was donated by the class of 1995. To the school, I think it cost eight thousand dollars back then. Um, you know, that's an equivalent of something like hundred thousand dollars now, or something like that. Um, so basically, what we, th this is one of one of several photographs that the university has in their library of the fountain from around that era. So this is the um, anecdotal evidence, or you know, photographic evidence that we have of what it once looked like. Um, let's see, um, so this is what it looked like in 2011 when we uh, went to uh, do our first assessment of the fountain. So the most notable thing that I noticed when I saw this fountain for the first time was, well, I hadn't seen the old photograph, so the first thing you would notice is that it's completely monochrome painted, um, but what I noticed was the color of the pool, uh, swimming pool blue, basically, um, and well, in the black and white photo you can see it wasn't like that, but um, uh, basically, um, These were these were the outstanding, you know, from a distance sort of things. And then as we as we get closer to the fountain and we look, we find that um, all of these intricate details of this Victorian sort of sculpting um, is completely washed over by thick, dripping layers and layers of paint. It was the the school's practice to maintain this sculpture by completely overpainting every year. Come in. Paint it off white. Paint it off white again and again and again. So, um, so the pool was the same way. Um, we we go in. You can see in the back 
there's a small section that's been cleaned off, but um, it's probably just peeled off because when you go in, we, we found, you know, we could pick up a piece of blue paint that when you look at the side, you see the striations of various tones of this pool blue color um, and also all of the walls on the interior are cement and they're all sort of lined with these drawn in lines of caulking, clear uh, s uh, silicon caulk and you can see that they've been trying and trying to, to uh, keep this fountain functioning um, even though it was proved not to be right. So the problems that we, that the, that the, the university wanted to repair were the, um, the leaking of water was, was, was pretty much their, their, their highest priority because they were losing a lot of water. Um, you know, they're typically, typically they would just feed the water into the fountain when they filled it up for the season. And then, um, ideally a small amount of water would be added as the water's lost to evaporation or, you know, a little bit of, since the water function is up in the air, the wind would blow some out on a strong windy day. Um, but they were losing a lot more than, than they anticipated and were just gushing water in from their system to the pool. Um, the overpainting became a problem. Um, the fountain just didn't look good. They, you know, a after a while, this, this uh, process of continuously overpainting, overpainting, um, even the even the guys who were overpainting it weren't happy after they were done. And you know we had the alligator skin and paint and you know all 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 types of different stuff on there. Um, so anyway, they wanted to uh, find a way to not have to do that. Um, and the the iron was was really starting to uh, stain through the paint. Um, you know the, the the chlorine in the water was probably uh, speeding up, uh, you know, helping this corrosion uh, process. Um, so the the water treatment and the actual pump system from the water was also the the pump system was completely outdated. Um, the tank typically a tank holds a quantity of water to be uh, to back up the pump system, um, and that tank was basically a rusted steel. Uh, Container that was, you know, was was on the verge of um, completely failing itself. Uh, let's see here. So, yeah, um, the this is our first time seeing the the masonry structure underneath the cast iron the wall. Um, essentially, the the, the, all the outside of the pool is lined with a cast iron wall um, with urns and sort of corner sections holding uh, all the 12 sides of this thing. Um, so when we opened it up, we discovered um, that it's actually a brick structure inside the wall. And you can see that on the right, um, there are gaps in here and holes, uh, existent. Uh, you know, the, the, the concrete in the wall, it's not consistent, so you have a lot of gaps there where water's going to definitely find its way out if that uh, splash coat on the inside of the pool uh, were to crack, I mean, it just goes right out. So, um, so, uh, okay. So here's the fountain after we removed all of the cast iron. Um, clearly crumbling away. The 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 um, you can see in the back just removing the cast iron from the structure. The the walls broken broken back. Um, so this is obviously something that we wanted to update and modernize. Um, you know we didn't particularly want to replicate this situation because it's um, obviously the guys who put this in in the first place had a hard time making a consistent wall, a consistent pool inside the cast iron wall. It's a challenge to sort of do that. Um, 
One thing I want to just point out on this picture is at the very bottom of the uh, brick wall, you have this gray stones. These are these are uh, field stones or a type of limestone native to the area um, in, in central Pennsylvania there um, that we wanted to so some things we wanted to replace and, and change which is this, the way they built these walls some things we wanted to keep the same which is the layout of all the stone work so all of these stones that you can see at the very bottom were taken out and cataloged so that we could put them back exactly where we had them so everything that uh, is, was visible from the fountain before we got there is back where it go, belongs uh, when we when we leave. Um, another thing that's notable is the platform in the middle, the, the plinth where the where the main water feature stands on top of. You can't see it in this picture, but this uh, the whole pool was built and cast around this pl uh, plinth. This uh, stone wall, let's say, uh, plinth goes all the way down into the ground. Um, so it interrupts the floor of the pool. Um, uh, the, pool the pool floor isn't, isn't consistent. It has this sort of column through it. And there's actually a hole through the middle. Um, so water is actually going down. This is serving as a type of a drain. So when the water comes and leak, was leaking into the, the cast iron feature, it was going right out and out of, into the ground uh, and not into the pool as it was designed to do. Um, so, so that gives you a little overview of what we found there. Um, here's a great picture. They, um, in 1961, there was a campaign to restore this fountain. Um, here you have a picture similar to what I just showed you from 2011. This is from two, uh, 1961. The wall, it looks the same, you know, but um, there's, we, we, when we look at this and we look at the wall that we tore down and replaced, um, it looks as if this was a brick wall, too. So they took it down and they put a new brick wall up. Um, the, the university wasn't interested in going through that again and, and making a wall that was going to fail the same way as the old one was and since this was an interior structural part of the piece we felt that it ethically it was a good choice to upgrade to a more modern um, reinforced concrete uh, situation so that they wouldn't experience the same kind of leaking for the same reasons so what did we do? We um, we came in. We like I said, we took all the stone that we wanted to retain and replace and, and place back where it was. We took that stone and cataloged it, palletized it, took it from the site. We um, came in and we dug a what's called turn down footing, um, basically like a, kind of like a foundation for a cement slab, um, which would serve as the floor of the pool. Okay. Um, so we came and excavated. We didn't intend for it to be quite so deep and, uh, well deep, but not quite so wide. Um, but the, the ground here, um, whether it had been from the, from the water uh, flow, was very soft and it was difficult to sort of frame in a foundation. So we did what we could here and um, and so our turn down footing is actually much more rugged than, than we intended, which is actually good, I suppose. Um, so in the, that's the picture on the left. And the picture on the right, before we poured our turn down footing, we installed all of the modern plumbing. Um, this includes basically the water that's fed to the central feature. Um, you can see that goes to the middle. Um, a, a, a drain, the drains, you can see those off to the two sides. Those are drains uh, that come into an, uh, another PVC pipe that leads out of the fountain. Um, let's see, we have a, a new uh, skimmer, which is the, the one that's poking up closest to me. Um, that's, a new, that's a new addition to the pool to help them maintain and clean the water so that they don't have to do 
uh, you know, it just didn't have it before and it, and it helps to keep the water clean so that people aren't trying other techniques like adding chemicals or, or what have you. It just helps them to, it will help them clean the pool. Um, and then we have an, some other things like an excess, uh, an extra drain and metal uh, PVC conduit for 12 volt uh, lighting, uh, submersible lighting. So we installed all of that, and then of course the the rebar grid, um, to to uh, for the con to uh, stabilize concrete. So here's the the, the turn down footing being poured on the on the left and on the right. So there you know ended up being a lot of concrete, um, and then after this turn down footing, then they reset the skirt stones, which are the the ones that go around. Uh, the sidewalk area, and then um, poured the pool floor directly uh, inside of that. Um, okay, so um, so essentially, after the floor was poured, and that was poured solid, um, we decided the, the with the university um, that we had to make a sort of a a judgment call, uh, something between um, conservation of the uh, of the stone portion of this fountain um, and the conservation of water that they were hoping to do. So we eliminated the column jutting through the base and into the ground, and we poured the the base pour floor of the pool um, completely solid so that you have a containment of the water. You don't have this drain in the middle. And then, um, so on the on the uh, on the left, you see that we installed the entire cast iron wall. We um, leveled that. The wall was actually supported by the masonry structure, so so we put it into place, connected the entire wall together, and. Um, then we have our rebar on the left. You can see the rebar that uh, connects to the to the floor uh, comes from from the floor. So essentially, we put a polyethylene sheeting bet uh, between the uh, to to line the the, the cast iron. Um, and then once that was all all set up, we built a wooden framework um, and used that to level the, the, the shelf of the cast iron and, um, and with that we poured the concrete, we shot the concrete into this as a sort of a mold or a form mold. Um, so, so that the uh, wall would be continuous and instead of the brick uh, construction now you have a cast concrete solid construction and um, cast directly onto the the pool floor um, so you have this seamless sort of construction. Um, after that was done we used uh, basically waterproofed the entire floor and the walls with one continuous layer of um, Carabond uh, waterproofing which is a cementitious waterproofing material that's essentially a splash coat um, or a thin layer of cement that's uh, uh, applied to all the cement uh, surfaces. Um, so, and, and you know, the result from that was that the, uh, the interior of the pool looked exactly as it did when it had a brick wall with a uh, splash coat of cement on there as it did before. Um, but now it had, uh, you know, the, a more solid construction. Also, we, along with the university, chose not to paint this blue um, because the historic photographs and the aesthetic of the people at the university was to keep it a more of a natural cement color so that the water would look more like it did in the photographs. A dark sort of uh, sort of 
just a reflecting pool without this. Um, so here they are removing the forms. Um, you can see the skirt stones are back in place. Um, we've started placing, what we did was we took the top three tiers um, where, the, where the stone came out, originally came out of the pool uh, floor. We actually um, took the, those, those two tiers, we took and, and um, saw the bottom layer. So it sat exactly as it did from the, uh, from the floor originally. So visually, everything is looking just as it did, but now you have this water retention of the pool instead of losing it down that shaft. Um, so that's about that. Um, the, the, as a side thing, the top stone uh, for the base is actually one giant uh, stone uh, that when when we started the process we knew that it had, it had a crack through the entire thing um, there are different ways to address that but since we and so our uh, conclusions were to place the stone back into a mortar bed as it was and address the crack after it's placed back in because it was so big and there's actually a square hole in the middle um, it would have been well it could have it could have been addressed in many ways but we chose to do it this way because you have this being held together with its mortar bed so what we did is after we installed everything and had it leveled and everything was true um, we filled these cracks with the injection mortar uh, yawn m40 injection mortar um, so that we wouldn't have any, you know, cracking from water, freezing, uh, ice jacking. Um, okay, so that was the pool. The uh, color scheme was another one of the university's priorities. Um, they, they, they didn't know what color uh, they were dealing with here, but with the original photographs, they were, you know, they were certain that they had this multicolor situation. Um, another historic photograph, it's actually a hand-painted uh, postcard, and we can see the color again. We can't use this really as reliable evidence, but, but it did lead us to believe that this wasn't just black and white. It looks like it has some green or something. Um, and Anyway, this is the sort of ev this is the sort of evidence we had, so we had to go find more uh, better evidence. Here's uh, all the iron from the fountain uh, after it's been disassembled. Um, still has the off-white paint on it. Um, uh, Robinson Iron uh, had this in their facility, and they were they 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 tried as as best they could to to find any evidence of original paint, but. Um, they, they weren't sure that they were able to do that. So I went down there with the, let's say, conservator's eye um, and went right into the nitty gritty, you know, and uh, nitpicky and found some of these pieces. It seemed as if the central feature hadn't been completely disassembled in the 60s. So um, when, we, when we took off the, some of the smaller elements, um, we could see in the, in the gaps, I think I have, uh, we could see in the where the where the elements were still stuck together, kind of um, that there was evidence of this green, uh, this red, something, and um, so we we actually harvested samples from here to be analyzed um, using microscopy. Uh, this is this is Keystone uh, methods of trying to discover the paint uh, colors. That we were, uh, that we wanted to use to recommend to the university. Um, I'm, uh, you know, I'm I'm not in the analytical business, so I actually wrote these down from what they had given me. But um, essentially, this is a, this is visual. Uh, so.
they're they're showing us the the several layers of um, paint that they're that they find uh, here. Um, you can see that the the colors on the left F two is this green color um, F three. You know, we're seeing these striations, but we're and uh, they they are they are detecting this green color. Um, but what I wanted to say about this slide was, this was very helpful when I was when I was trying to explain to the people at the university that their maintenance process of overpainting instead of properly cleaning and touch-up painting was trapping these sort of uh, contaminants in their paint layers. Um, so, so what they were thinking they were doing was adding an extra layer of protection, but what they were really doing was undermining every layer of paint that they put on there and creating more of a problem. Um, so it, it helped us to sort of convey to them that what they want to do is proper cleaning, touch up, uh, touching up the paint where they have uh, problems, and um, less is more uh, and they received that well um, so basically what we what we found from that was that the reddish brown color was the bottommost layer um, so we didn't find that on any on the rest of the fountain um, maybe I maybe I didn't say that the, the, the entire fountain had been sandblasted so th we found these colors only in those hidden areas so we found the the red color at the bottommost the green color and the bright white color were the second most layers. And then all the substantial layers, all the layers after that, um, were all this off-white color. And they were pretty consistent with the off-white color. They've been painting it for 60 years or so. Um, so we used these colors. We offered them to the university as evidence of the original colors. And when, when I presented them with, with this, you know, uh, the, the red wasn't really, what didn't really spark anything for them. It was uh, the primer, so nobody ever would have seen that anyway. But the, the, the green, they, they told me that, oh, that's why everything in this building is that color, you know, because they probably, when they had the fountain painted originally, this was the color. This was the color of the university. Um, and it probably when they installed the fountain originally, they, they said, well, we want the university color. So anyway, we had the evidence. They took it for what it was worth, and they decided to go with that. So um, these we, um, Keystone provided us with the Munsell uh, color, uh, chip color, uh, that from their analysis. We used that. We, we used that to... Um, basically have the paint company mix the, mix the color for us, and I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. So uh, our process, painting process, uh, started with the, the zinc-rich primer. Um, essentially, this is a paint um, that has this, uh, I believe it has a 60% solids of zinc in the, in the paint. Um, it works as a sacrificial layer, uh, and um, basically the the, the zinc. Um, okay, so uh, you have the zinc zinc primer, and then we went with another primer, and then we essentially mapped out the color for for the uh, Robinson Iron, who uh, first painted the the entire thing with the Endure Shield. Um, that's a, a urethane uh, top coat, um, and then they did the, the green, and here you go. That's the that's the finished job. I actually had a lot more to talk about. <laughs> I've run out of time. Sorry about that. We have time for one question. Carol.
I just wondered if uh, the perimeter of the basin hadn't been originally painted to look like this, to be the same color as the stone. It looked like that kind of on the postcard. Was there just yeah. like that? Um, well, it did look like that on the postcard. Yeah, um, it's just a postcard. So. It was a hand colored postcard. Um, what we did was we took the, the stone, we pulled it off, and we used the Munsell chips. We actually had a, a book of Munsell chips. And we brought them there, and the representatives from the university, um, along with us, we, we looked at the chips and we tried to match the color of the stone. Um, and the thing is, the stone before it had been cleaned had a really light color. And then later on after the process, it had, it had been cleaned, and some of that um, sun-baked, let's say, lightness of the stone had gone away and it had darkened. So mm, what will happen is those stones will lighten and match the color. So well, that, was, that was maybe during the process. Um, one of the, maybe one of the things that everybody wishes is that we had chosen a slightly darker color for, the, uh -huh. for that. But, um, Ultimately, they were happy with it. And there wasn't, there weren't any paint remnants around the perimeter because of the rebuilding of the wall. I mean, you couldn't find any paint chips. No. There. No. No. The origin from the original. Yeah. No, because of the they they had intervened before, yeah. so everything had been blasted yeah. away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. It will. Okay. Maybe we'll be around. Thank you.